So the last video I did was on why Brexit is bad for the NHS. And just looking through the comments, I could see two clusters of criticisms. One was, it's the government that's messing up the NHS, not Brexit. The other one was, immigrants are burdening the NHS. So let's deal with both of those. With the government, yes, the government has been messing up the NHS. From private finance initiatives to not training enough staff for the NHS. So that's Mike Garsworthy representing scientists for EU. And I'm responding to this video more to do with the NHS than to do with how immigration affects the NHS. When it comes to immigration, my research goes more into how they affect employment but I'm willing to go into unfamiliar territory and maybe make a right fool of myself in the process. So please, please Mike Garsworthy, respond back if you see this. I will send it to you as many ways as I can. But now let's go into this claim that the government has been messing up the NHS by private finance initiatives and not training enough staff. I would have to disagree with you on both points. The first point I would like to address is the private finance initiatives. What I would say to this is that this is not unique to the Tory government. Labour also did this and it seems that the Tory government is just following the same path as the Labour government. From the book Lives at Risk. To reduce its waiting lists, the British National Health Service recently announced that it will treat some of its patients in private hospitals, reversing a long-standing policy of only using public hospitals. And the NHS has even contacted with HCA International, America's largest healthcare provider, to treat 10,000 NHS cancer patients at its facilities in Britain. You may at this point, think that I'm making a two wrongs make a right argument. But every single country that has a single payer health system has come to this conclusion that they need to privatise parts of their health service to cope with the environment that they are in. Australia has turned to the private sector to reform its public health care system to such an extent that it is now only second to the United States among industrialised nations in the share of healthcare spending that is private. Since 1993, the German government has experimented with an American-style managed competition by giving Germans the right to choose among the country's competing sickness funds. The Netherlands also has an American-style managed competition with an extensive network of private healthcare providers and slightly more than one third of the population insured privately. Sweden is introducing reforms that will allow private providers to deliver more than 40% of our healthcare services and about 80% of primary care in Stockholm. Even Canada has changed, using the United States as a partial safe value for its overtaxed healthcare system. Provincial government and patients spend more than $1 billion a year on US medical care. Each of these countries' growing frustrations with government health programmes has led to the re-examination of fundamental principles of healthcare delivery. Through bitter experiences, many countries that once trouted the benefit of government control have learned that the sure remedy of these countries' healthcare crisis is not increasing government power, but increasing patient power instead. Now we go on to the second point, that the Tory government isn't training enough staff. The Conservatives are not the only government to do this, and as time goes on, this will become more of a case. In order for healthcare not to cost so much, the government limits supply. They employ only so many doctors. They buy only so many MRI scanners and they build only so many hospitals. It saves the country money by creating a bottleneck and increasing waiting times. This can be seen on the following chart. 
So if you look at it the other way, if we create too many hospitals, if we train too many staff, and if we buy too many MRI scanners, we will bankrupt the country. So we sacrifice paying with our money at the point of service by paying with another currency, being our time. And yet again, we are not the only country to do this. It just seems to be the way single payer health systems are going. In England, with a population of almost 60 million, government statistics show more than 1 million are waiting to be admitted to hospital at any one time. In Canada, with a population of more than 31 million, the independent Fraser Institute found that more than 870,000 are waiting for treatments of all types. In Norway, with a population of almost 4.5 million, 270,000 are waiting in queues on any given day for various types of medical treatments, including hospital administration. In New Zealand, with a population of about 3.6 million, the government reports the number of people on waiting lists for surgery and other treatments is more than 90,000. On the surface, the number of people waiting may seem relatively small to the total population, ranging from 0.5% in Canada to around 2.5% in New Zealand. However, considering that only 60% of the total population enters hospital each year in developed countries and that only a small percentage require serious and expensive procedures, these numbers are quite high. In New Zealand in 1997, more than 20,000 waited for a period of more than two years. What I'm trying to say here is that yes, the Tory government is not training enough staff and privatising, but this has to be the case. You could argue that they are taking this to the extreme, but I don't think it's fair just to say they haven't trained enough staff. To the underfunding that started in 2010, to the complete screw up of a reorganisation in 2012. That's not the question. The question is whether Brexit makes life better for the NHS, makes life worse for the NHS or makes no difference. And NHS experts, as in those people who actually run the NHS or spend their lives researching NHS functioning, the vast majority of them think that Brexit makes it worse for reasons of finances, for reasons of staff hiring, for reasons of research and innovation. I refer you to my previous video on that. Now, on to the issue of immigrants and immigrants burdening our NHS. You know, Surely our NHS will be better off with less immigrants, right? No, not necessarily so. The real question is, do people pay their way? It's not just a question of do people pay their way. There is also another question. This question is, once people have paid their way and their national insurance payments have been taken, how are they distributed back to the public? Now I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation to show you how the NHS is not egalitarian in any sense of a meaning. This is a PowerPoint presentation and all the data for this work has been taken from the Good Hospital Guide and also data.london.gov.uk. So now that's out of the way, let's get started. The chart to the left shows the results that were obtained from the Good Hospitals Guide's investigation into health inequality. It states the mortality index Doctors per 100 beds and nurses per 100 beds for hospitals in London. For mortality index, the lower it is, the better it is. But for the other two data sets, the opposite is the desired effect. Now, what I've done is plot each hospital onto a map of London boroughs on Google Earth. A simple ad hoc task was then performed using the data on the website data london.gov.uk to find out which of the boroughs are the wealthiest and which ones are the poorest. The next step was to take out all the boroughs that did not fall 
into the top 14 wealthiest boroughs of London. Then once this was done, the top 14 performing hospitals regarding the previous mentioned categories will be placed into this map and we will be able to see if they fall in or out of the affluent areas. The NHS spends 20% of its annual budget on the Greater London area, although the 15% of the population living there has access to the most private sector services. So before going into this, it's important to note that right from the get-go, we are talking about inequality. First, for the mortality index, the mortality index is the data set which shows the likelihood of you dying during your stay at hospital. Here is a shot of the Greater London area, with the top 14 affluent areas of the Greater London County highlighted. Now we can add the top 14 hospitals for this data set, and what we find is that 13 of the top 14 hospitals are located within the top 14 affluent areas. Now this could be due to the poor people having worse diets or being more stressed out. So let's see the same test done again but with the other criteria. So the same task was done again but with the number of doctors per 100 beds. When we perform this task we find that 11 out of the top 14 hospitals for this criteria fall within the realms of the better off areas. The next task will be for the number of nurses per 100 beds and when this operation is done we obtain a similar result with 11 out of the 14 top hospitals for this criteria falling within the realms of the bourgeoisie. The final stage is to look at the hospitals that serve the smallest populations and again the same task was performed and the results that followed was that 9 out of the top 14 hospitals for this criteria are within the areas of the middle class. The conclusion is, once viewing all this evidence, I believe it is easy to see that the better the mortality rate is, which the hospital has, is due to a lot more than just outside life choices. There certainly seems to be inequality in the NHS, as the hospitals that exist in the wealthiest areas are better equipped with doctors and nurses. Not only are they better equipped, they also serve the smallest populations compared to the hospitals in the more financially inferior parts of London. So we have 20% of the NHS annual budget going to 15% of the population. That has the greatest access to private healthcare. But within this 15%, we have a lot greater percentage of that budget going to the wealthiest parts of the city that serve the smallest populations that have even greater access to private health care and it's at this point you start to realise why your university professor is a socialist. There seems to be nothing that we can do about this. As yet again, this happens in every single country that has a single payer health system and it has something to do with democracy. As your MP will not spend the money that they receive on who needs it, but rather on what will get them voted back in. Which seems to be if you love democracy. Then you have to accept that the richer people will get a better service. As all around the world, there is a link between the greater amount of money one earns correlates with the greater amount of percentage of one's earnings one is willing to spend on healthcare. There is no reason to suppose that their preferences will radically alter by national health insurance and for us to reason to suppose that in allocating public spending vote maximising politicians are doing anything other than responding to voters preferences. So let's get back to the point it's not just a question of do immigrants pay their way which I'm very doubtful whether they do. I may get back into that in the second part of this response but it's also a question of where the immigrants have chosen to locate themselves. If they have located in the poorer parts of the UK, then you are adding great amounts of pressure onto the weak links in the chain. And this could result in massive burdens on the NHS and its services, even if they do pay their way 
on a holistic level. But anyway, I'm stopping the video here. I will make a second part as it's Easter and I want to spend some time with my family.